Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. It was a normal business day at the Imperial Bank, with as many visitors as usual, but toward the end of the day the crowd became smaller and there were few more customers. A girl of about seven years old walked in. She was dressed very poorly. A washed-up jacket with a broken zipper, old pants, and stunted, obviously oversized boots. In her hands she held a child's green pistol. The guard looked intently at the child and thought, What is she doing here, so little and alone? Where are the parents? It seems a pity to kick her out. It's cold outside. Let her get warm. The child's face was serious, her eyes tearful. The girl confidently went to the window and pointed her toy gun at the cashier, saying, Auntie, make me a millionaire. Give me money, I really need it. Otherwise, everyone will be bad now. And the child cried. Sandra, the cashier, had seen many things over the years and thought that nothing could get through to her. But here even she was confused and did not know how to react whether to cry or laugh at a ridiculous childish prank. According to the instructions in any incomprehensible or dangerous situation, the cashier is obliged to press the alarm button and call the banker in the hall. The woman decided to do just that. A few minutes later, Mr. Donald came out into the hall and with surprise looked at the little girl with the gun, who continued to sob and smear tears on her cheeks and asked Sandra, what happened? An emergency situation. What's the problem? The woman replied with a smile. Well, this little guy wants money. He wants a loan. Otherwise he threatens me with a gun. I do realize that it is a toy, but just in case I decided to invite you. The man was dumbfounded, but no sooner had he said a word than a woman of about 75 came running into the bank. She was also poorly dressed, but neat. The older woman grabbed the girl by the hand and mouthed off. Hannah, honey, why are you going alone? I can't keep up with you. You've got people worried. Mr. Donald was stunned. Well, my dear citizen, is this your granddaughter? What kind of a circus are you trying to pull here? What a bunch of burglars. You can get punished for jokes like that. We are a serious organization. The child should be better supervised. The grandmother just waved her hand. How can we not arrange it, the circus? We have already been denied credit in all banks. So Hannah got desperate. Her mother is dying in a coma and needs an operation. And they're asking a lot of money for her. What's the baby's way out? Tell me. She must have seen a lot of movies and decided to take a desperate step. You'll forgive her, for God's sake. Mr. Donald took another stern look at the little girl, something he liked her. She looked like someone else, but he could not understand who. The child folded his arms in the form of a prayer and looking straight into his eyes began to beg. Uncle, lend us some money, please. Mommy is dying. Just do not persecute us. My grandmother and I have nowhere else to go. Something sank inside and the banker took pity. He waved them off. Okay, let's go to my office. Let's talk thoroughly. You tell me what your story is, and then we'll see what we can do. In the office, the older woman sighed and began to tell. I haven't even introduced myself to you. Mr. Donald, my name is Mrs. Nellie. You see, it's a long and complicated story, but I'll tell you the main thing. Hannah's mother's name is Mary, and she and her daughter rent a room from me. She's a good, decent, hard-working woman who sells baked goods at the kiosk. It was hard enough for her. She worked 12 hours a day just to have enough to live on and for the baby. Two months ago, Mary was driving home late at night when she was hit by a car in a crosswalk. And best of all, she fled right away. A passerby called an ambulance. Well, she's in a coma and needs emergency surgery. Here, I have all her diagnosis with me. I made copies, take them. Where can you get that kind of money? There's no one to help no relatives. Hannah's on me now. My pension's only a few cents, and I'm about 80 years old. I feel sorry for Mary and for Hannah. If she dies, they'll take her to the orphanage. What kind of a future for her? It's a dead end. Have pity. Look at the paperwork. 
See if you can get her alone. Don't think about it. Mary will be fine. She'll work it off to the last cent and more. We'll pay it back together, little by little. Well, a man ain't gonna die if he ain't got no money after all. Mr. Donald looked at his watch and said, I understand you. I'll look at the documents at home tonight. I'll try to help in any way I can. The bank is not mine, but my father-in-law's, so everything depends not only on me, and your situation is really difficult. I'm sorry. I have to go. Hannah, don't be sad. Here, have a chocolate bar. And he smilingly handed the little girl a large milk candy. The child timidly took it and said quietly, Thank you. I believe you will help us. I do not want mommy to die. The banker returned home to the posh mansion. Everything there was unchanged. In the kitchen, food from the restaurant, the wife did not rush to meet her husband. On the contrary, she was dressed in a provocative dress with a huge slit and stiletto heels. Donald asked her tiredly, Where are you going tonight? Jessica wrinkled her nose and answered grudgingly. I'm having a girl's night out with my friends. Why shouldn't I? The man shook his head disapprovingly. And the outfit is not for baccalaureate party. Don't you think you're out of line? Jessica suddenly grinned sarcastically with her brightly painted mouth and replied sarcastically. As I remember, you got a job as a banker with my father, so be happy. And the rest is none of your business. Bye bye. I'll be late. And she left clacking her heels loudly without even looking back. Donald sank tiredly into his chair. He felt sick and disgusted. I'm so sick of everything. This marriage of convenience and that obnoxious silicone hussy Jessica and this mansion where everything was alien. It's like I'm not living my life. For Christ's sake. And then he remembered the old woman's papers. They were still in his briefcase. Well, since the evening was lost anyway, I would at least look through it. And he went deeper into reading. But he nearly collapsed as soon as he saw the patient's last name. He was shaken with shock. Landau. Mary Landau. It cannot be. Oh my God. So that's what Hannah looks like. Exactly. The man hopped over to the bar, got some cognac, poured it into a glass, and sipped a large portion. Then he leaned back in his chair and plunged into deep memories of the past. Mary had grown up in the countryside, and her childhood was hardly a happy one. Her parents died too early. Her mother in childbirth, her father was hit by a combined three years later by an accident. So her granddaughter was raised by Grandpa Stan and Grandma Molly. They lived poor, poor lives, fed from the vegetable garden, and the goat helped them out. Grandma made delicious cheese and cooked milk porridge. As a child, Mary was more of an ugly duckling than a beauty, thin, unshapely, and a little wild. But when she graduated from high school, everything changed. She simply turned into a beautiful swan, a slender, shapely beauty with prominent third-size breasts and plump, naturally sensual lips. All the local men were openly looking at her, smacking their tongues. Grandma Molly began to worry and taught her granddaughter. Watch it, Mary, do not spoil. Men have one thing on their mind. They all promise a lot. And if something happens, bang. And in the bushes, the girl remembered her grandmother's words and steadfastly held her ground, not letting anyone near her. With work in the village was quite sad. And Mary hopelessly went to the farm to Zion, a local rich man. She seemed to be just getting settled, trying to get used to the hell of hard work. But it didn't work out. The rich man was a well-known lover of women and booze. Everyone in the village knew that. So he began to take care of Mary, then pinches the back, then looks at her breasts point blank, then tries to press the frightened girl in a dark corner. And he whispers to her, Mary, my girl, how sweet you are. I'm drooling. Be mine. I'll make you rich. You'll be dressed in silk and bathed in gold. This fat, filthy and disgusting womanizer was so disgusting to Mary that she pushed him out of sight, blinking so as not to see the sweaty, disgusting face. And one day the girl could not stand it, ran home, 
cried and told her grandmother everything. I won't go to the farm anymore, grandma, no matter what you do. That nasty Mr. Zine is groping me, promising me the moon, just to get me into bed with him. And I'm so disgusted. I don't know what to do. Granny was indignant and raised her hands to the sky. Look at him. What a bastard. Not for nothing the women whispered, he won't miss a single skirt. And he's got a wife and three kids. He's a goddamn dog. Stan, come here. Let's have some advice. Have you heard what the granddaughter is grieving about? What's there to do? There's no other work in the village. Maybe we should go to the chairman, complain, let him put a lid on this ghoul. Grandpa spat and smeared his hand. What's the use? They are all one for one. Mary's a pretty girl. She ought to wear a burqa. She won't have a life here. Let her go to town. There's a lot of people there. Nobody cares about anybody. Maybe she'll find a job. Maybe she'll marry well. All the young people have gone there. And no one's gone missing. Mary was both glad and frightened at the prospect. And Grandma Molly, agreeing with her husband, ran around the neighborhood asking for money for her granddaughter's journey and for the first time, for they themselves literally did not have a penny. Thanks to kind people, they collected a lot of money. Grandma divided everything into piles, wrapped it in a handkerchief, and gave it to her granddaughter. So, do not keep everything in one place, or they can steal. Put a little in different pockets, and for the purse and bag keep an eye out. Otherwise I know you. You open your mouth like a crow, and it's gone. I've calculated that you should have enough for a room and live for a month or two. And then it's up to you. Don't be lazy. Remember what I said about men. That's it. It's time. Let me hug you, granddaughter. Don't forget your grandfather and grandmother. Don't forget your grandparents. Come and visit. Grandma Molly cried and waved for a long time. Grandpa Stan just grumbled. What in God's name? You're getting damp. Think good thoughts. Mary's going to make it. She's a pretty girl, not lazy, with a head. Mary was uneasy on the train, with all sorts of bad thoughts in her head. But at the train station, a very nice, intelligent man joined her in the compartment. They chatted cheerfully about different things. He joked and told interesting stories. And the girl laughed without a pause and completely relaxed. After a couple of hours, the man cheerfully said goodbye and left, and Mary went into her bag for money and decided to order tea. Suddenly she couldn't find her purse. Her insides went cold. There was most of the money in there. Stunned girl rushed to the conductor. God, my traveling companion took my wallet with money. When, how did he manage? I do not understand. Chattering all the time. What to do? She only shrugged her shoulders. Have not you ever traveled in trains, and there are more crooks ride here than at the stations. It was necessary more attentively for the property to watch. Probably already got off the train, rascal. That's all for now. Mary spent the rest of the ride roaring like a beluga. She had no idea what to do or where to go. She scraped through her pockets her grandmother's sacks, but it was a drop in the ocean, not even enough for a room. She imagined horrible pictures of herself begging for alms or worse. She scolded herself with the last words. God, what a fool. My grandmother told me to be attentive. But no, what a good man. What will happen to me next if I have not yet reached and already got into the story? Out at the station, Mary gawked frightenedly as she clutched her traveling bag and the lady's bag. She looked like a lost and cornered animal and her mind was a mess. Suddenly she was approached by an older, stylishly and expensively dressed lady. She immediately identified with her trained eye, the young frightened provincial girl who obviously had something wrong. The stranger introduced herself. Hello, darling. My name is Mrs. Nellie. I'm a recruiter. I'm a recruiter for a cleaning company. Did something happen to you? The girl was even more frightened. She had never heard such words before and answered quietly, sobbing. I am. I came from the countryside to look for work. All my neighbors collected money from me, enough for a room and food for the first time. But a man on the train sat next to me 
and somehow slipped through my fingers and stole my purse. What to do, I do not know. But keep in mind, I will not do all sorts of impropriety. My grandmother warned me that in the big city they can offer such things. Mrs. Nellie laughed. You don't understand, silly. I'm recruiting maids and cleaners, not what you think. If you need that kind of work, I can help you. At the same time with the issue of housing will solve, because housekeepers tend to live in the house of the rich. Only I say it once, you need to work hard, to fulfill all orders without question. The owners are not rude and not impertinent. Well, do not do, you know, what? As you put it, obscenities. Otherwise, there are some who want to get into bed with their rich husbands. Mary calmed down, smiled, and nodded her head. Then I agree. Don't worry, I'm not like that. I've never even had a boyfriend before. I'll try my best. You won't regret hiring me. On the same day, Mrs. Nellie gave Mary a full briefing. Another couple of days it took to learn all the tricks of the maid, how to use modern appliances, and the girl was safely employed in the country mansion to the landers. They were bankers and very famous businessmen. Besides her, another maid, Lana, and a cook, Hannah, lived in the house. The head of the family, Mr. Dunny, turned out to be a stern little man with glasses. He said hello to Mary without even looking at her, but his wife, Mrs. Irene, did not like Mary right away. The lady was fat, richly dressed, her face a grimace of discontent, her lips pursed, and her gaze seemed to drill right through her. She long and fastidiously inquired about Mary, who she was, and where she was from, and told her the rules of the family, the daily schedule, and her duties. At the end, the woman said, We also have my son, Donald, living with us. He's a student, finishing his degree in economics. He's in class right now. I warn you, don't even look in his direction. I know how you sneaky hicks are. Mary barely made it through the exam and was finally released to the servants' quarters. There she met Lana. The woman asked quietly, what has our mega woman already intimidated? She can do that, but do not be afraid. I'll teach you everything. They pay good and steady. You will not earn such money wherever. So agree to everything and do your job as it should. And don't mind Mrs. Irene and try not to make her angry. Don't let her see you. She's always so unhappy. And so Mary's working life began. At first she did not succeed in everything, because in the village, except a broom, and a rag girl did not know any gadgets. But Lana, as promised, quickly taught her, and after a month Mary could easily cope with any task. The pay was really good, Mary had never held such money in her hands before. All would have been well, work and be happy if not for Donald. The first time she saw him, she was cleaning the windows in the hallway. The girl stretched as hard as she could and tried to wipe as well as she could. The boy quietly came up behind her and admired her, a tall, slender, busty beauty, her blonde curls disheveled from under her bonnet, droplets of sweat on her temples. He couldn't take his eyes off the new maid and regarded her shamelessly. Mary felt someone's eyes on her and looked away. She was embarrassed and almost fell to the floor from the stepladder, as the tall, athletic, handsome boy was unceremoniously staring at her. But Donald deftly picked her up and kept her from falling. In his arms, Mary felt dizzy and lightheaded. He smelled of expensive, tart male perfume and the touch of his strong hands on her waist sent a thousand shivers down her body. The girl immediately recoiled and mumbled, I'm sorry, Mr. Donald, you startled me. I didn't expect to see anyone at this hour. It's morning, everyone's at work. The young man winked at her. Why so formal, Mr. Donald? Just call me Donald. We're basically the same age as you and I, and you're Mary, I take it. Well." Where do they make a pretty girl like you? You shouldn't be a maid. You should be in a modeling agency. I'm delighted. The girl blushed at such compliments, completely embarrassed, apologized again, and grabbed a bucket and a rag and ran away. Next, she and Lana went to whip out the pillows, and her partner whispered to her, 
I saw, near you hostess's son rubbed. Do not even think. Otherwise Medra will just kill you. She for her beloved son three skins off. He's a good-looking guy, though. I don't deny it. But you know, people like us don't get anything but a bit anyway. So why ruin your career? You get embarrassed. They'd never take you into a proper house. Mary nodded her head. Yeah, I'll try to keep out of his sight. I don't want any trouble. From that day on Mary's work was a game of hide and seek, especially when the boy came home after class. The more she tried to keep out of Donald's way, the more he would appear out of nowhere and try to talk to her. The conversation seemed harmless, nothing of the sort, but the way he looked at her, it was more expressive than any fervent confession. That look made Mary's insides tear up and overturn, a million butterflies fluttering in her stomach. She stiffened, blushed, and, like a little girl, just ran away. Another weekend came. Lana was let go home and went into town, and the hosts went to see important guests, too, and said they would definitely be gone until the evening. Mary dutifully completed all her errands and was perfectly free. Only there was nowhere for her to go. No one and nowhere was waiting for her in the capital, and it was a long way to go home to the village. So the girl decided to take a walk along the forest paths to breathe in the fresh air. She enjoyed the nature, breathed in the fresh aroma of pine needles and herbs, and thought about her own things. Suddenly, as if out of thin air, Donald appeared right in front of her. She even jerked in surprise. He laughed. Hi, Mary. Did I scare you again? I'm sorry. I got home early. I thought I'd go for a run. I do a lot of exercise around here. I see my beauty coming. I can't believe I missed her. Mary blushed again, and Donald suddenly pressed her against the mighty pine and passionately dug into her plump, sensual lips. The girl tried to moo and fight back at first, but after a second she just got dizzy and her legs buckled from the pleasure, and she stopped resisting. How sweet those kisses and hugs of his were. The strong, trained body, the scent of the man, and that look that seemed to paralyze her. Breaking free at last from his embrace and catching her breath, Mary gibbered. Donald, don't. What are you doing? What do you want me for? I'm just the village maid. I'm not your equal. I'm not a match for you. We can't be together. Your mother warned me on the first day to stay away from you. The boy answered her with heat. My silly girl, you don't know what you're worth. You're a beauty, a goddess. Ever since I've seen you, I've lost all peace and sleep. I swear it. You're all I think about. Why do you push me away? I feel you like me too. But Mary suddenly burst into tears and ran to her room. She shut herself inside, fell on the bed, and sobbed even harder. And Donald was right. They were drawn to each other like a magnet, and there was nothing they could do about it. And now, after such a passionate kiss, she was literally shaking. Her whole being, not having known before male love and caress, literally demanded a continuation. She scolded herself. What kind of fool am I? Again, I look for myself problems. Why did I have the misfortune to fall in love with him? What kind of punishment? There was a quiet knock at the door. Donald whispered, Mary, open up, please. Well, I beg you. We need to talk. The girl exhaled, wiped away her tears, and trudged to open the door. On the threshold stood a boy, smiling guiltily and holding in his hand a charming bouquet of daisies. Excuse me if I scared you or hurt you. I did not mean it, honestly. You know, you're the most beautiful girl I'd ever met, the purest and most open, and I'm definitely in love with you. I called my parents. They will be gone for a long time. We're all alone in the house, except for the gardener. Let's go to my room. I don't feel comfortable talking in here. And Mary went, of course. They talked long and warmly. Donald professed his love for her. And then he began to cover her neck and body with tender kisses and whisper to her such words that made Mary melt. Anyway, that was the day their first intimacy happened. The guy was amazed that Mary was innocent since she was already 19 years old. 
by city standards that was simply unthinkable. He began to treat her even more tenderly and reverently, realizing that she had given him the dearest thing. From that day on they began to meet, first secretly, sneaking kisses like schoolboys on every corner, and then officially. Donald really loved Mary very much, he was not playing around, and he intended to marry her. The boy truly believed that his parents would understand him, because true love was more important than officials and regalia. But when he announced it officially, at dinner, and introduced Mary as his bride, a deafening scandal broke out in the family. Mr. Iron screamed, It'll never happen. Donald, are you out of your mind? What was it that surprised you in bed with that redneck that you decided to marry the maid? Do you want our family name in the press and in high society? It's an unheard of disgrace. Then she turned to Mary with her face twisted in fury and shouted, Get out of here. I knew she shouldn't have hired a pretty little country girl as a maid. Good for you. You don't get lost. You're like a tick. You're all over my son. You want a residence in the capital and a life in chocolate. You'll get by. You'd better earn it first. You're used to spreading your legs. Mary sobbed and tried to justify herself. Why are you doing this? Donald and I really love each other. I don't want anything from you. Money isn't everything in life. Mrs. Irene pointed at the door. Get out. You're fired. I'll complain to the agency and they won't take you to any more decent homes. Mary ran off in tears to pack her things. Lana whispered to her. And I told you, Donald's going to make a fool of himself. And that's it. My mother will never let you meet, much less get married. The girl cried. I don't believe it. He said he loved me and couldn't live without me. He's coming for me now, and we'll leave this house together. Lana only twisted at her temple and went away, or else she would get the hot hand. Meanwhile, the fighting continued. Donald shouted emotionally. Ah, so. Then I'll go too. We'll make it on our own. If you care about millions more than the happiness of your beloved son, I love her, don't you understand? I really love her. Then my father intervened. Until then he had been silently watching. So, son, here's the scale. On the one half you put your career, wealth, a rich and prosperous life, and our help. And on the other, you're Mary. That's it. How long can you stay with her in some cockroach dorm without proper facilities? How long can you stand working 12-hour shifts? You'd run away from that life in a month. Only I won't take you back. That's my condition. Take your pick. If you leave with her now, I'll block all your cards and you'll never come back here again. By the way, there's your sweetheart, leaving with a suitcase. Come on, run after her. Mary turned around for a second and tried to catch Donald's eye, but he lowered his eyes and didn't budge. The girl shouted after him, you coward, you bastard, I hate you. And she ran away in tears. She was seething and boiling inside. Grandma was right and Lana too. They all want the same thing. How could he? He promised he wouldn't betray us and we'd be together to the end. He said those words, swore his love, and he's not. A mama's boy. I despise him. And I'm a fool, fell in love, swam. It was a good thing she had hardly spent any of the money she had earned during those months, and she had managed to rent a room from a lovely woman, Mrs. Nellie, on the outskirts of town. But when Mary realized a month later that she was pregnant, she was horrified and burst into tears again, telling her landlady everything honestly. Mrs. Nellie at first began to advise her, why don't you tell your fiancé you're pregnant? Would he take pity and marry you? Or will he help you? Anything can happen. But Mary just waved her hand. No, Mrs. Nellie, he's not getting married. He can't get away from his mother. If that woman finds out I'm pregnant, she'll make me die. I'd rather have an abortion. Mrs. Nellie shook her head and looked at the girl judgmentally. Don't you dare, girl. Don't take it so hard. I'll do what I can. I'll keep my eye on her. And to kill a living soul is a very bad thing. A child is God's plan. It's not given to everyone. 
I would have given anything at one time to have children, but no, God didn't give it to me and that was it. That's how they lived. Mary got a job at a kiosk nearby, selling pastries. The owner was an Armenian, I shot. He saw, of course, that the woman already had a slightly protruding belly, understood everything, but he took the job, took pity on her. He knew there were not many people running for the job, and this one would hold on to it with her teeth, and that's how it turned out. Mary was a saleswoman right up to the time she went into labor. When she went into labor, she called Ashot and said in a panic, Close the kiosk. I'm on my way to the maternity hospital. The keys are where I usually keep them. Don't take my place. I'm begging you. Put me on the night shift or two days. When they brought her a big rosy-cheeked, cheeked Hannah to the hospital, she kissed her and cried. The baby looked just like Donald. The woman whispered, Your daddy doesn't want us. The hell with him. We'll make it on our own. My dear, we'll make it. The first year of the baby's life was especially hard for Mary. The woman was literally torn between work and her baby girl, sleeping four hours at a time. Thank you for Mrs. Nellie. She helped out, and Hannah was quiet, not giving much trouble to the elderly nurse. And then it got easier. Hannah went to kindergarten. If she was sick, she stayed with Mrs. Nellie, or sat in Mary's booth, on the sacks in the corner, drawing. Not once in all that time did Donald make himself known in any way. He just blotted that fleeting affair with the maid out of his life. And that was it. And Mary, no matter how hard she tried, could not get Donald out of her heart. He sat there firmly, though she now had mixed feelings for him. Hatred, anger, contempt, love, tenderness, awe. She knew they would never meet again. He was too important a man to forget and go on living, but she could not. On that fateful night, Mary was hurrying home to her daughter. She was just crossing the road at the intersection. The light turned green for pedestrians, and Mary walked. And then a bright red sports car came straight at her at breakneck speed, and the woman only had time to notice that the driver was a blonde. Next came the squeal of brakes and darkness. Donald, of course, didn't know any of this since he'd been a coward and betrayed Mary. They hadn't been in touch. His parents persuaded him a year later to marry Jessica, the daughter of a millionaire banker and owner of the coolest, most expensive gas stations in town. The wedding was lavish and pompous. The bride was a platinum blonde doll, expertly molded by the best specialists. Her figure was also flawless, and everything would have been fine. But Donald did not like her at all. In fact, this arrogant and arrogant arrogant girl was frankly unpleasant to him. Jessica, on the contrary, Donald liked the outside very much. Athletic, tall, pumped up, and handsome. That is why the wedding took place, but quickly satisfied with it all their sexual desires in bed, glamorous woman frankly bored. She wanted a drive, to fly to Paris or relax in Bali, to be carried in the arms and worshipped, and fans used to do so. Her husband was different. He was busy day and night at work. After all, Daddy had given him a position as manager of a large bank. When she looked into his eyes, she wanted to see admiration, but there was clearly red contempt. This so infuriated the woman that she, without thinking twice, got herself a lover out of boredom, and then another, and then another. Donald sensed wrong, and began to express his indignation. They often began to fight. It was incomprehensible to him how a married lady could go out all night and come home in the morning tipsy. It was unheard of. But Jessica would always put him on the spot. You live in my mansion, and you work in my father's bank, so sit quietly and keep quiet. Otherwise I'll complain to daddy, and they'll throw you out like a little dog. What am I supposed to do with you at home? Stand at the stove and give birth to screaming babies. Oh no, you don't. That's not what I was born for. Donald was indignant. Why did you get married in the first place? I don't understand. If you don't want a family and children. The woman laughed. What you were born for too? Who asked us? My parents benefited from it. That's all. 
Now they have a powerful corporation. Everyone is happy, and me too, by the way. In high society, I have a decent spouse, and I'm a lady of status. And where I go at night is none of your business. With you in bed it's boring, I'm sick of it all. So they live like cats and dogs, two complete strangers under one roof. They had been sleeping in separate rooms for a long time, and the closeness had gone to nothing. A thousand, a million times Donald regretted that he had chickened out and betrayed the woman he loved. For he had never forgotten Mary, and he knew that he would never love anyone so much again. Donald reread the diagnosis over and over again, whispering to himself, Mary Landau, Mary Landau, my God, is Hannah my daughter? My beloved woman lives in poverty and is now dying, while I sit here and drink cognac. With trembling hands he dialed the number of the hospital and found out exactly where Mary was lying. The man went there at once and decided to talk to the attending physician. It was late, but money solves everything, and the doctor agreed to meet. He sighed and replied, I'll tell you the truth, Miss Mary's situation is terrible. As a result of the collision, she has a serious head injury. She has been in a coma for a month, and there is no progress. The only chance to make a difference is to perform urgent surgery on her brain and remove the damaged areas. But here, too, there is no guarantee that the woman will survive it or survive it all. Personally, I will not take on that responsibility. There is only one specialist in the capital, a virtuoso of his craft, and a lover of experiments, that is Mr. Collins. Ask him, maybe he'll operate. Besides, it's a very expensive operation, and the family don't have any money, as I understand. So, Donald was shaking, almost screaming. Give me the coordinates of this Collins, I'll meet him tomorrow. Can I see her? Just for a few minutes, please. The doctor just waved his hand. What the hell? The patient is almost dead anyway. The man quietly entered the IQ. What he saw shocked him. Instead of the fresh, blazing beauty of Mary on the bed lay a haggard woman. Her eyes sunk inward, her cheeks were gone, her complexion blended with the sheets, not a single blood vessel, and her entire skinny body was enveloped by dozens of gauges and wires. Donald instinctively took her hand. The hand was icy and dry and he whispered to her, Mary, my girl, forgive me, you brute. You will not die, do you hear? I will lay down my bones, but I will get you out of the clutches of death, for your daughter's sake, for ours. I still love you, do you hear? Believe me. It even seemed to him that her eyelids twitched, and he began to ask her forgiveness again and again. The very next day, Donald put everything aside and went to see Collins, the renowned medical genius. He carefully studied all of Mary's medical documents and thought about it. Then said, the operation could be done, of course, but it would only be at my own risk. There is no 50% certainty that the patient will survive. It's too late, you know. Most likely, irreversible processes have already begun, and the woman could either die immediately without regaining consciousness, or she could stay. How can I put it delicately? An incompetent person. I'll tell you the amount, it's very large. I warn you, and I'll stress once again that the risk of death is enormous. And I only agree to it because it's the first time for me too, purely out of experimental interest. Donald began to reassure him. Well, you said yourself, if you don't do anything, Mary will die anyway. There's no chance of her coming out of the coma and getting better. Isn't she incompetent now? So why not try to save her life if there was even a 1% chance that a miracle would happen? The sum was indeed enormous, even for a man as well-to-do as Donald. He emptied all his cards and accounts and quickly sold only the recently purchased expensive Porsche, and that was barely enough to cover all the expenses. Immediately, he made a transfer to the clinic and called Mrs. Nelly. Good afternoon, Mrs. Nelly. It's Mr. Donald here to see you. Do you remember we talked about the loan for your friend, Miss Mary? I have some news for you. Give me the address. I'll be right there. The businessman stopped at the children's store on the way 
and bought a new jacket and shoes for Hannah, and many more clothes, toys, and two bags of groceries. He had a hard time finding the right house number in the yards. The dwelling was old, but quite well maintained and comfortable. They were already waiting for him there. The kettle was boiling in the kitchen. The old lady was fussing and setting the table. Hannah was there to help her grandmother. An excited Mrs. Nellie said hello, invited her guest to the table, and asked, Thank you, Mr. Donald, for not forgetting about us. Well, will you give us credit? Will they approve it? Because the hospital says it's too late and Mary's not likely to make it. I don't want to believe that. And the old woman began to wipe away the tears that had accumulated in her eyes with the corner of her handkerchief. The man rushed to reassure her, don't worry, you won't need a loan. And no one would give you such a huge amount with your income. I have already paid for everything. The operation the day after tomorrow at the Institute of Neurosurgery. It will be the best surgeon in the capital, Mr. Collins, I have agreed. Let's pray and hope for the best. The old lady even shook her hands and could not believe what she heard. God, you are our savior, our benefactor. What a lot of money that is. May God give Mary a recovery. We will work it all off as long as she survives. Hannah suddenly came up quietly and hugged Donald tightly in her warm little arms. She looked him straight in the eyes and said, thank you, uncle. I will pray for you now, and for my mother, that she survives. She's not going to die, is she? She and Mrs. Nellie are all I've got. Donald instinctively hugged the baby, and felt such warmth and tenderness inside, gently flicked her nose, and held out two huge bags. This is all for you, come and measure. And if you do not have the right size, then I'll instantly change. The woman and the girl aghast and the baby ran happily trying on new clothes and toys to consider. And the businessman began to put on the table products from the remaining packages. Here, this is also for you, for the first time. I think I took the most necessary. Mrs. Nellie even cried. Thank you so much, my dear man, for taking such good care of strangers. These are the times when people forget their own relatives, and even strangers. Donald suddenly said, in a husky, broken voice. Mary is no stranger to me, you know. She was my first love, my strongest love. And I betrayed her once. I was a coward, a bastard, not a nice man. I ruined my life and hers. Maybe Hannah's my daughter too. I don't know. So I really want her to live. And I'll be on my knees begging her forgiveness. And he waved his hand and left, trying to suppress the sobs that were bursting from his chest. On the day of the operation, Donald did not go to the bank at all, shifting all duties to the deputy. He walked like a caged tiger down the hospital corridor and waited. Time seemed to have stopped altogether, and the hand of the clock froze and did not move. He asked the Lord in his own sincere way, in his own words, Dear God, help me. I wish Mary would live. I know that I am a wretch and very guilty before her, but you see that I still love her. I don't want anyone else, just her. Let her get well, please. Mrs. Nellie and Hannah sat quietly on the couch. The girl was not crying, not hysterical, apparently also concentrated in prayer and waiting. Four hours passed. Finally, Mr. Collins came out of the operating room, took off his cap and came to Donald. Well, gentlemen, you can rejoice. I don't want to brag, but I'm very happy with the result. Now let's see the dynamics. But the chances that the woman will come to her senses are great. Let's hope for the best. You can't see her. She is in intensive care. Come back tomorrow. Donald began to shake the professor's hand and thank him. Hannah also ran to the doctor and said, thank you for saving Moni. She will recover, won't she? The doctor averted his eyes and quietly replied, I want to believe that your mother will get well, but not everything depends on me. I did everything I could. The operation was a success, and Mary finally came to her senses. As if out of a thick, lingering fog, she heard her daughter's voice. Hi, Mommy. How are you? Already better. When you open your eyes, 
I miss you so much. Mrs. Nellie and I are going to get your medicine, and someone wants to talk to you. And then Mary heard the husky voice she'd never forgotten. Mary, my darling. It's me, Donald. Forgive me, darling. I'm the last bastard. I betrayed you like that. After all these years, I still can't forget you. I remember everything. Our kisses, your overflowing laughter, your big beautiful eyes. I don't know if you'll ever forgive me, but I really want you to get well. Everything inside the woman suddenly turned over and warmed. She pulled herself together and wanted to shout to the whole world. I have not forgotten you too. I love you too. But she only managed to open her eyes slightly and whisper, me too. All the sensors on life support suddenly turned red and beeped, and frightened Donald ran out to get a nurse. Here, quickly, Mary woke up. Immediately, the staff rushed into the room, started a commotion, began to look at the woman's pupils, and check the reactions. The man was escorted out the door. Hannah and Nellie had just arrived, and were very frightened when they saw the panic in the room. The child immediately cried, Mommy's sick isn't she? Why are there so many doctors there? Has she gotten worse? The man held the baby close to him and reassured him. On the contrary, honey, don't worry, mommy is awake. Can you imagine? She heard your voice and mine and came to her senses. I can't even believe it. Finally, they were allowed to see Mary. The woman saw all her family and friends and cried. Hannah threw herself around her mother's neck and began to hug and kiss her. Mary wailed. Daughter, darling, I was so worried about you. I'm so glad you're all right. Mrs. Nelly, thank you for looking after my daughter, not abandoning her, not sending her to an orphanage. Donald, how are you? I thought I'd never see you again. The old lady said, that's the director of the bank where Hannah and I went to get a loan. Mr. Donald paid for your operation if it wasn't for him, I don't know. Nobody gave you a chance. Only the famous professor Mr. Collins took on the surgery at his own risk, and that's because Donald miraculously talked him into it. So there you go. Mary looked at Donald with gratitude and such fondness, and said quietly, Thank you for life. You're my guardian angel now. Donald, I guess we need to talk. Hannah and Mrs. Nellie nodded understandingly and left the room. The man sat down closer and looked at and admired this short-haired sparrow with huge and so appealing eyes. He compared her to Jessica's doll-like artificial face and realized that he couldn't be under the same roof with her for one second. The man took Mary's hand and said, looking directly into her eyes, My darling, forgive me if you can. I am so sorry to you. I chickened out back then got into dependence on my parents. I regretted it a hundred times. They talked me into marrying Jessica, the daughter of a millionaire, but she and I are complete strangers. We live like cats and dogs. You're still in my heart, and I don't want anyone else. Mary's eyes immediately filled with tears, so it's not going to work out again. But I want you to know that Hannah is your daughter. I found out she was pregnant after we broke up so I decided to keep the baby. Donald waved his hands. I know Hannah's mine. I guessed it. Don't say that, I won't leave you now. You know that. I'll talk to Jessica today, and we'll divorce her. I want to live with you and my daughter, understand? Please believe me this time, please. Mary grinned. Do you think she will give you a divorce so easily? And if she doesn't, I'm scared. I remember how your mother humiliated and embarrassed me, and I don't want to go through that again. The man replied quietly, Don't worry and don't think about bad things. Get better. I bought all the medicines. I will come every day. Tell me better. How did it all happen? Why haven't they found the one who ran you over? The woman sighed and shrugged her shoulders. I don't remember much of anything. The light turned green. I was walking across the crosswalk, and all of a sudden this red car came out of the dark, and out of the corner of my eye, I could see that a blonde was driving. And that was it. Donald bent down and kissed Mary gently. I'll take care of it. The culprit must be punished. Well, I'm off. It's time to go. Know that I'm happy I found you, 
and I won't let myself lose you again, and I won't let anyone hurt you. Mary wiped away a tear. However, I love you, Donald, and all these years, I've never been able to tear you from my heart. Donald returned home late at night. To his surprise, Jessica was home waiting for him, looking worried. Where have you been for so long? What's going on? You've never been late before. Dad said you sold your car and withdrew all the money from your accounts. What was that for, I wonder? The man sighed and replied, Jessica, we need to have a serious talk. I needed the money to help someone who was in trouble. I want to divorce you. We've been strangers for a long time, and we don't like each other. And you know that very well. So why torture both of us? Besides, you have someone else. I know it. I also met a woman that I foolishly lost years ago, and I still love her very much. So, is that the maid your mother kicked out, and you spent all your money on her? Are you out of your mind? I won't give you a divorce, you know that. I don't want any more gossip in high society. I'll call your father right now, and you'll be naked and barefoot. Surprisingly, Donald wasn't frightened or upset at all. On the contrary, he was relieved. I don't care do what you want. I'm packing up, I'm leaving, and we're getting a divorce. It should have been done a long time ago. Jessica was shocked at her husband's determination, for he had never crossed her before. She was hysterical, screaming, and started calling her favorite daddy. And Donald silently packed his things in his suitcase. He wanted to be free quickly from the fate into which he had been trapped for years by his parents. Now he had someone to risk it for, and he wanted to change his life dramatically for Mary and his daughter. The scandal was deafening. The millionaire was terribly furious. He immediately fired Donald as a banker, blocked all of his accounts, and even went to the hospital, wanted to scare Mary. But he didn't succeed. This time, the woman stood her ground. You can even kill me if you want to, but I will not give up Donald. We love each other, you understand, don't you? To be on the safe side, Mrs. Nelly had gone with Hannah to a friend's house in the country for the duration of the scandal. You never know what those crazy millionaires might get into their heads. Donald wasted no time either. He moved into a rented apartment for the time being and decided to look through the security cameras at the very intersection where Mary had been hit. What he saw shocked him. The red foreign car belonged to his father-in-law and his wife, Jessica, was behind the wheel, not alone, but with her young lover. The tape clearly shows her hitting Mary and then driving away without even looking back. What a twist. The man was furious. What an asshole. How could you do that? Hit a man and not even get out of the car to check on him. No help. How could anyone live in peace after that? Go to expensive salons, tanning salons, fitness classes, knowing that you may have killed a man. Such cynicism was simply not in his head. He made arrangements with the employees of the city's video camera company and took the tape. Without thinking twice, he dialed Jessica's number. She answered right away. What, honey? You scared of your chicken. Come to your senses. Come back immediately. Apologize. As long as I am kind. The man interrupted her menacingly. Listen here. I've got the surveillance tape, and it shows you running Mary down and fleeing the scene of the crime, and I'm going to go to the police with her tomorrow. How much time do you think they'll give you in court, and what will they say about you in high society? You're such a bitch. You almost killed a man yourself. You have a young lover, and you dare accuse me of something. Or should I show that tape to your father? I guess I'll do that. I'll send him a copy so he can see his precious daughter. Jessica's voice trembled, and she immediately changed her tone. Donald, look, don't get so hot. Don't go to the police. I don't want to go to jail. I won't make it. And don't let your father. He'll kill me. You know him. What do you want? Let's make a deal. Donald said, you put the money that went into my account for Mary's operation and convince your daddy to leave Mary and me alone, and you will disappear from my life forever. Otherwise, I will carry out my threat. Is that clear? 
Jessica was quick to speak up. Yeah, sure, I'll do it. We'll leave quietly and amicably. Thank you. You're right. I never loved you either. The other night I had too much to drink, and I got cold feet when I realized I'd hit a man. I just drove away, that's all. What was I supposed to do? Voluntarily go to jail. The man sighed. God be your judge. I said it all. Goodbye. Jessica kept her word. She wired Donald the money he had spent on the surgery, and the millionaire daddy stopped pestering Donald and Mary. The woman began to heal quickly. Donald visited her in the hospital every day. They talked at length, holding hands and feeling their hearts beat in unison. Soon Mary was discharged home. Mrs. Nellie returned with Hannah from the village, and the family council decided to live together in the old woman's house. She asked for it. My dears, all of you stay with me. I am lonely. I have been so used to Hannah and Mary. They are like family to me now, even closer. It's a nice house. It could do with a bit of repairing. It hasn't seen a man's hand in years. And if I die, you'll keep it. I don't have any relatives anyway, but I have my own yard, a vegetable garden, and a place for my kid to run around. And I will not be bored in my old age. Everyone happily agreed. Donald literally, in a couple of months, did a major renovation, expanded the kitchen, equipped the nursery, and added another room, a living room. Everything turned out modern and cozy. The man did not regret at all that he was no longer rich, got a job in a small firm as an economist, and worked hard. He forbade Mary to trade at the kiosk, and so she was not bored at home, bought her a sewing machine. After all, the woman had dreamed of it since she was a child, and finally she enrolled in a sewing course. She began to do well, and soon her first orders came. Mary couldn't be happier. She didn't have to work too hard carrying boxes and 12-hour days. She enjoyed her home, her family, and her favorite hobby. Donald had changed a lot over the years, from a cheerful, carefree major to a serious and responsible family man. Three months passed, Hannah called the man Mr. Donald, and it directly corrupted him, and he decided that it was time to tell the girl the whole truth and put it in his name as it should be. In the evening, the man sat down beside the child in a chair and began an important conversation. Hannah, I need to talk to you seriously. You see, I'm not just a stranger mister to you, but your own father, a real one, and I would like to call you daughter and give you my last name. What do you think about that? The girl looked at him strangely and suddenly asked, If you are my daddy, why didn't you live with us before? Where have you been all this time? So it was because of you that mommy cried a lot at night. Did you leave us? You didn't love us. Why do you love us now? What if you go away again and mommy cries? Because if you love someone, you don't leave them. Hannah forcefully threw the pencil on the floor and ran away crying. Donald was very upset, even though he knew his daughter was right about everything. If you love someone, you don't leave them. And he did. Mary began to reassure him. I told you, it's too early, she does not understand. She's too young. Mrs. Nellie decided to interfere in the conversation, though she did not usually do so, but this was a very serious matter. Don't be angry, but I will talk to Hannah. She's not a little girl. She's just offended at her father. After all, she saw her mother suffer for so many years. We have to explain it to her properly. She's a smart girl, and she's an adult. She'll understand. I'll be right with you. Mrs. Nellie came quietly into Hannah's room. Hannah was lying with her head on the pillow, sobbing. The pensioner began to talk, as if not with her, but simply. There were a prince and a princess. They loved each other very much. But an evil witch came and broke them up, separated them. The girl suddenly said angrily, Stop treating me like a little girl, Grandma. I'm a grown-up, and I understand everything. My father left my mother, and he did not need us for so many years. And now he loves us, you see. And then suddenly, he doesn't love us anymore. Is that so? The old woman sighed. Well, if you're a grown-up, then listen to another fairy tale. That's right. And you're right. Your father was young, 
and listened to his mother. She forbade him to love your mother. Yes, he chickened out. They broke up. Your mother realized she was pregnant with you, but she didn't say anything to her fiancé. So you can't blame him either. He simply didn't know about you. Do you understand? And when he read the documents and realized that it was his beloved woman who was dying, what did he do? That's right. He saved her, just like in the fairy tale. And why? Because, my dear, he loves her very much, isn't that clear? Your daddy was very happy when he found out he had a daughter. Now you're together as a family. What's wrong with that, tell me? Don't you love him? The little girl answered quietly, I do, and I want it to be that way forever. Mrs. Nelly then added, Well, then why do you resent him? We are all not angels, and often we do not only good things, but also nasty, disgusting, nothing can be done about it. It is the way of man. The main thing is that your father realized his mistake, repented, and now you are together. And it's not our business to judge him, you little brat. Parents should be accepted and loved, no matter what they are, because they're the people closest to you, understand? The girl wiped her nose, smiled, and hugged her grandmother. Grandma Nelly, how clever you are. You told me everything so well. And why, silly me, was I mad at my father? She rushed happily into the living room and took Donald by the hand. Well, Daddy, shall we go and have some tea? That big chocolate candy is mine. The man happily picked up the little girl in his arms. Daughter, my sweetheart, you're not mad at Daddy anymore. She shook her head. No, I'm not. I love you. You will always live with us now, right? And Mommy won't cry. Donald kissed his treasure and promised. I swear to you, Mom will never cry again, and you too, because I will never let anyone hurt you. Then they all drank fragrant tea with candy and cakes, which Mary and Mrs. Nellie had baked together, and talked and made plans for tomorrow. Mary sat next to Donald, snuggling up to him, and realizing that this was a woman's happiness, finally getting to her.